folks, welcome back to the workshop. My name's Brent and welcome to the third part in my three part video series on timber frame layout. If you haven't seen the previous two videos, go back and check them out because we're really going to build on what we already covered in the previous two videos. As you can tell, we're in the cabinet making shop right now and that's because we're going to build some templates. We're going to talk about how to build them and we're going to talk about how they can be really helpful in the process of timber frame layout. Then we're going to take our templates up to the big shop and we're going to show how they can really help with the layout process on a very simple but twisted, crooked and kind of banana shaped post. We've gone through most of the layout stuff before, so we'll go through that fairly quickly and then we'll jump right to cutting the joinery. The questions I've had a lot lately is how you cut nice square joinery if the surfaces of your timber are completely out of plane with your actual hypothetical inner timber. I've got a few tricks and a few jigs for that. I hope you find it helpful. Okay, let's talk about templates and timber framing. So why would you use templates during the timber framing layout process? There's a number of different reasons. I'm going to talk about a few of the big ones here. First of all, it increases the speed and accuracy of your layout. To draw four or five lines on a timber using your framing square is kind of a multi-step process. And if you're trying to do it accurately, it takes a fair bit of time. Now, to sit a template down on the timber, trace all four sides, takes no time at all. But also, each and every time that you do that, what you draw will be exactly the same. Also, if you're doing a center line layout, it's easy to make a template that will reach all the way across the timber, whereas a framing square wouldn't require in kind of a two-step process. It doubles the time involved, but also doubles the opportunity for error. Templates also improve the accuracy of your layout. Every time you lay your square down and draw a line, it's another, another opportunity for a mistake, like I said. However, with a bit of care, setting it on a timber, a template will give you an accurate layout every single time. Let's talk about the template material itself. Uh, I make mine out of kind of whatever I have uh, lying around, but if I was to purchase material for making templates, I'd probably buy Baltic Birch. Baltic Birch is always flat. The edges and corners are quite durable as well in the out of ply materials usually made of higher quality stock. So it cuts really, really cleanly, which makes it a lot nicer for tracing against with your pencil. So what can you use a template for? Well, basically you can use it for any joint that you have to draw on a timber repetitively. I usually don't bother with rarely used joinery, but I have some for but brace mortises and housings tie beam mortises and housings, wall plate mortises and housings. Some of them can be served kind of as, can serve double duty as, as router templates as well. Uh, but also they're great for laying out scarf joints, but they can also position pegs as well. And you've seen, you've seen me use uh, my big long template here for brace layout as well. Now I'll get into more details about how these work when I actually use them because there's a few different features about them that make it especially helpful. But I want to talk quickly about something to think about as you're cutting yours. Now, I typically do my layout with a half millimeter pencil, mechanical pencil. And what that means is that I have to make my templates about half a millimeter smaller because I like to work to the middle of my pencil lines. So when I trace this and I cut to the middle of my pencil lines, when I've made this a half millimeter smaller, the resultant joinery is exactly the geometry that I want. Now, before we head up to the big shop and show these in action, there are a couple of more aids that I build in the shop to really speed up the process I wanna show you. This is what I call my mortise checker. This is a piece of quarter sawn white oak, and this is milled to exactly two inches thick. So what I use this for, and you'll see this in the video coming up in a little bit, is just confirming that the mortises that I'm making are exactly two inches thick. And on the opposite side of that, this is a tenon checker. This is machined on the table saw to be exactly two inches thick. And I use that on the end of the tenons to, or on the tenons to make sure that they are exactly two inches thick. I try not to measure unless I absolutely have to. It's better to have a thing that represents the dimension that you want. You'll see these in action here in a few minutes. So let's head up to the big shop and show off some of this stuff. So the timber I'm gonna be working on is a first floor short post. And you can see here where it goes in the frame. It has a couple of braces and a post top tenon. And though simple, it has enough going on to show what we need to show. We are reducing the top of the post down to a perfect seven inch timber and that has to be perfectly sized, 90 degrees to the tenon and 90 degrees to the chalk lines. The braces need to be perfectly opposite each other and meet the underside of the tie beam exactly on the layout lines. 
So let's take a look at our candidate timber and get rolling. I've already dressed it and cleaned up both ends and decided it's suitable for where it's got to go. As you can see by the string line test, the timber is not straight. The framing square shows it's out of square. The level at each end shows a twist and it isn't sized evenly. I've decided what end is up and what face is in. Since the twist is mild on this one, I'm going to place the level in the middle and shim it as discussed until the level reads level. If it was more severe, I would consider placing it closer to the top to put the working planes closer to parallel to the face where it meets the bottom of the tie beam. This is the most visually important for this member because the top is the only place where it mates with another timber because the bottom is just sitting down on the sill. I'll find center on the ends make a small notch for the chalk line to sit in and snap my lines. I then hook the tape to the tenon end. Refer to the previous videos where I talk a lot about where you need to be cautious about using the hook. I mark the shoulder and the brace locations with tick marks as well as the bottom of the post. I then use my template to mark the shoulder line. This will serve also as my squaring line discussed in the previous video. The next template is the perfect 7 inch wide template and we'll use it in two places. One at the tenon to mark the width of the tenon but also the width of the reduction and how far down from the shoulder line it goes. 5 eighths is usually enough for a half inch re reduction or half inch housing. I also make a couple of quick marks on the sides adjacent to the brace locations to show where the bottom of the brace housing will be. More on that later. I then roll at 90 degrees, draw the tenon shoulder and the side of the tenon location, and then measure down to locate the brace, burning an inch or four inch or a foot or whatever works for you. I am offsetting the tenon an inch so that I can use my chalk lines as one of the margins of the tenon. I then use my brace template to delineate the brace geometry, making sure to have the mortise line up with the tenon. I just trace the outline because the center chalk line will split between mortise and housing for me. Last thing I do is carefully bring around the theoretical bottom. Then I roll the stock 180 degrees and repeat and finish with my squaring check with my fingers crossed. Since the end of this timber is actually going to be the end of the tenon, I use the 7 inch template again to draw the ends of the tenon. The level line on the end is one cheek and I just have to draw the other cheek and I have the tenon fully drawn out. We are now ready to start cutting the joinery. I'm not going to try and suggest the best way to cut the joiner because everybody's tool chest is a little bit different and everyone's comfort level with the tools is a little bit different and also everyone's personal preferences are a little bit different. I'll start with the tenon shoulders. The saw is set at exactly 90 degrees but the layout lines are not necessarily 90 degrees so I check very quickly so I know if I have to cut right on the line or have to back off a little bit. The depth of the saw is set to the shortest depth so I don't overcut it. Don't measure, just lay the saw on the end and adjust it according to your lines. I personally do cut right on the line if the geometry works for that, splitting the pencil line. Until you get the feel for that accuracy, I suggest you cut away from your line and finish it with a chisel. I then roll it once, grab the larger worm drive saw and cut downwards, almost always away from the line. I'll finish with a hand rip saw if needed. Then I roll another 90 degrees, cut another 90 degrees and cut again. At this point we have roughed out the cheeks but significantly we have reference lines on all three faces so we can use those to finish the cheeks. I tend to use a chisel or a shoulder plane for smaller tendons but it doesn't really matter just use whatever works for you. Just aim to cut halfway through your layout lines. So here's another very helpful tip. As you're chasing a flat plane on the cheek of your tendon Use some graphite on the straight edge of your tenon checker. Being careful not to rock it, rub that edge across the cheek and it will reveal the high spots that need more work. The final check is completed using the tenon checker. At this point, to reduce the sides down to 7 inches, you can chisel the remaining away, kerf and chisel, or plane it away, or use the jig similar to mine that references on the layout line on the end as well as the layout lines on two faces. When carefully set into position, the tops of the jig act as rails for the router sled perfectly parallel to our layout lines and a known distance away from them. All we need to do is set the router bit projection just right 
so it machines to the correct depth and we're good to go. The router bit projection will always be the same. No need to change it, even if there is variability in the timbers, because it's referenced on a constant datum, not the surface of the timber. Okay, let's talk about the router sled in a little bit more detail. So this is kind of the second version of this sled, and I might make another one, but this is getting really close. The biggest upgrade that I did was I used a polycarbonate base. This does two things. I mean, they're kind of related, but it does two, two main things. One, it allows a lot of light in at the area that you're working, so it makes it a lot easier to see. But also, because it's transparent, you can see through it, which really helps. And polycarbon is quite stiff, and this is thick stuff. It is expensive, um, but it's worth it in my opinion. However, it will still sag a little bit. So what these are is two relatively thick, right around half an inch or maybe a bit more Baltic birch. And on the bottom, they are countersunk and screwed in place so that stiffens the whole thing up a lot it's got to be wide enough to fit the base and also fit your hands in there but also it has to be long enough so that when you're running the router sled across a large timber it doesn't fall off your rail on the end now this is a this is a very high-end router this is a good quality Bosch router you don't need it for this I will probably replace Replace this with a less expensive one. You really, all you need is to have enough power to do, really a three horsepower, three and a quarter horsepower router would probably be better than this anyway. It just needs to be, I would suggest a half inch collet so that you can run a bit that's long enough so that it can extend out far, fairly far down, especially if you're doing deeper housings than just sort of a nominal half inch housing. The one change I may make to this for a future version is actually, believe it or not, make it a little bit longer so that if I'm working on a 12 inch uh, wide timber I can pull it all the way over to the edge of it and this won't fall over so this has to be at least 12 inches away from roughly the center or one side of the bit so this may need to be a little bit longer but also I want to find a good very small battery powered LED light that I can attach on here somewhere to point down in because even with the Lexan and, uh, and even with kind of a, a decent sized hole to peek through here, it still is a bit dark in there. So I think what I'd like to do is find one or two battery powered lights that I can attach somewhere good and just fit them on when I need it. Otherwise, this design of router sled works really well. I'm happy with it. Moving on to the brace mortises, I start with the chain mortising first. Since the chain mortiser is permanently set to 90 degrees, and the surface of the timber is not necessarily parallel to the working planes of the timber, we have to make sure we don't undercut the mortise while also ensuring that we're removing as much bulk as possible in the interest of efficient work. The marks on the adjacent sides of the timber that I made earlier give me a sense of which way the timber is out of plane with the working surface so I know which side to hug my lines on and which side to back away from them. So I can do a detailed video just on the chain mortiser if folks are interested. But very quickly, I add a quarter of an inch to the sum of the tenon length and the maximum housing depth. And I stay away from my lines a bit and mortise away. After all the mortises are roughed out, I clean up the mortise before I do the routering for the housing, which will remove all of my lines. The trick here is to make some mortise walls perpendicular to the working plane of the timber, not necessarily the surface of the timber. Now, there are two ways that I do this. If your surface is flat, but out of plane with your working surface, you can measure the differences between your two lines and set a bevel square to compensate for the angle. I have a homemade gauge that makes this easy and fast to set it based on the differences between the two and the width of the timber. You can then use this to keep an eye on your progress. So as you get close your mortise checker will really come in handy. Put a fresh coat of graphite on it, drive it down into the mortise and any high spots will be clearly highlighted for you. Alternatively, you can set up 
two rails that reference the chalk lines. And then with your mortise checker across the rails, you have a plane that is perfectly parallel to your working planes and you can use an ordinary square with it. These same rails will be used with the router sled to route the brace housings as it's perfectly on plane. If your timber surface is on plane, then a simple jig with a template cut style cutter works just fine. The router leaves rounded corners of course, so that gets cleaned up with a chisel. One way to check that everything is on plane is to set your mortise checker in the mortise, make it plumb, and verify that your tenon cheeks are also plumb. A more complete approach would be to re-level the timber using your original level marks and verify that the cheeks are level as well as the mortise walls. I usually mark the theoretical perfect post bottom, but I leave it wild until I transit survey the foundation for imperfections. The extra on the bottom means that I can leave a post a little bit long if there's a low spot on the foundation. Before you cook away, a couple of final thoughts and ideas. First of all, when you're making your cheat sheet, when you're making your drawings to take up for the layout process, make yourself a little checklist. So you can go down that checklist and make sure you've gotten absolutely everything. It's actually a really good idea to do all the same type of timbers all at once. So you're kind of your mind is in that gear. Then you can do all the same cuts and you can do all the same checks. Second tip is it's actually better if you get somebody else to do all that. Get somebody else there. They can help you move the timbers around because trust me, you don't want to hurt your back moving these timbers on your own. But second, having another set of eyes to check your layout before you cut and check the final product after you've done all your cutting before you sand and before you oil. Speaking of sanding, don't sand any surface that isn't going to be visible because you'll remove your chalk lines. Those chalk lines are there for you as a resource and as a guide after your frame is stood up because those, those uh, chalk lines should be perfectly plumb. Say for example, on an exterior post, the outer, the outer faces that are going to be buried by siding, they're never gonna be visible. So your chalk lines, if they're left there, you can put a, put a level, a long level on them and they should be absolutely perfectly plumb or the outside of the timbers might not be reliable. Similarly, when you're spacing your posts out on the frame, you can't reliably stretch a tape from the outside of one timber to the outside of the other and expect it to be perfect because your timbers may be unevenly sized and they may have a little bit of twist to them. However, your chalk lines will be perfect. Also, I wanna thank you all very much for your patience and the time it took to put this video series together. With the little tips and tricks and ideas and concepts that I've conveyed in this video series, you should be able to put together a Western style frame and have it reliably go together on raisin day, even if they're twisted or they're bowed or they're uneven. The reality of it is, is line rule is an extremely sophisticated and extremely mature method of joinery. And if you actually get into uh, Japanese architecture and Japanese styles of timber framing, the line rule process is much more involved and much more detailed. But this relatively simplified version of it will get you through a Western style frame, no problem at all. So again, thank you very much for your patience in this series. If you are, if you have any questions, please ask them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them. And um, if I need another video or it's more efficient to answer the questions in another video, I'll do another short video or a YouTube short or something like that. So we have an update coming up on the shop build project. So this is the end of the uh, layout specifics uh, series. And uh, so the next ones will be more about progress on the shop. Again, thank you very much. If you found this helpful, please hit the thumbs up button. We'll see you next time.